What's going on guys? Today we're going to be discussing IV fluids and IV complications. You can follow this video up with blood transfusion reactions as well as my fluid volume presentation, alright? So, we're going to discuss the three categories of infusions today. That of crystalloid solutions, which consist of hypotonic solutions, isotonic solutions, and hypertonic solutions. Okay, guys? Also, our colloid solutions, which consist of albumin, mannitol, and dextrin. And lastly, blood and blood products, which consists of stuff like packed red blood cells, whole blood platelets, frozen plasma, and albumin. So we're going to start with crystalloid solutions, which consists of hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. So our hypotonic solutions, these are the solutions that make fluids shift from within vessels into the intracellular spaces, which is going to cause the cells to swell, okay? Examples are solutions such as 0.25% normal saline, 0.45% normal saline, and 5% D5W which is dextrose within water, guys, and dextrose is a form of glucose. Now, indications that would indicate the need for hypotonic solutions are things such as hypernatremia, which is too much sodium within the body. And remember, when there is hypernatremia, it is more than likely that there is fluid volume deficit. So giving hypotonic solutions will shift fluid within cells Furthermore, swelling them, providing that hydration, cellular hydration. And also diabetic ketoacidosis is another indication for these hypotonic solutions. Next is our isotonic solutions, and they increase fluid volume within vessels, and they have the same osmolarity as plasma, which is also why there will be no fluid shift, guys, okay? There will be no fluid shifts using isotonic solutions. Examples include 0.9% normal saline and lactated ringers, or ringers lactate. And this is also going to provide electrolyte replacement, okay? Okay, lactated ringers has a lot of electrolytes. So the indications for isotonic solutions are things such as hypovolemia, when we are dehydrated. Also guys, we're gonna to want to monitor for fluid volume overload when providing isotonic solutions. Here's the last crystalloid in this presentation, and that is our hypertonic solutions. And these solutions serve to draw fluid out of the cells into the intravascular space, furthermore shrinking the cells, okay? So we're taking fluid out of the intracellular, putting it into the intravascular. Being that the fluid is going into the intravascular space, this is going to allow for vascular expansion, okay? So examples include D5, 0.45% normal saline, D5 0.9% normal saline, and hypertonic saline 3% or 5%. So hypertonic solutions are used for things such as dehydration as well. So remember, being that fluid is being drawn out of cells into the intravascular space, a complication if this solution isn't monitored can be electrolyte imbalance. Also hypervolemia and edema as well, guys. So we're going to want to monitor for that. And our next category is colloidal solutions, and these are our plasma volume expanders. Colloidals are used to maintain the vascular volume and to expand the vascular volume. It also replaces proteins and is used in cases of burns and hypovolemic shock. Examples include albumin, dextrin and mannitol. So albumin is used to keep fluid within vessels and it also replaces protein. If albumin is low, fluid volume will leak out causing edema. So albumin is going to keep fluid in the vessel. Moving on, dextran shifts fluid within the vessels, expanding it guys. So here again, monitoring for that fluid volume excess is going to be important. As for mannitol, it reduces cerebral edema and it eliminates toxins within the body. Now our last category, which is the administration of blood and blood products, consists of five different components. The first being packed red blood cells, and they are given for things such as anemia or chronic blood loss. Giving packed red blood cells will help bring up both oxygen and red blood cell value within the body, guys. Next is FFP, and FFP is given when there is deficiency in clotting factors, that fresh frozen plasma. Also, it's given to reverse an increased prothrombin time and international normalized ratio, which will prevent bleeding. Lastly, it can be given for DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now, platelets are given due to bleeding or thrombocytopenia, which is low platelet count, guys. Lastly, we've already discussed albumin, but it's going to be given in this case to correct any complications that our crystalloid solutions do not amend. And remember, therefore, that volume expansion, keeping fluid within the vessel. Now, we're going to talk about complications associated with with IV therapy. And we're gonna to want to remember that appropriate documentation must be charted and must be done, okay guys? So here's a list of complications. We have phlebitis, infiltration, and extravasation. We have fluid overload. We have ear embolism, systemic infections, and hematomas. Now we're going to discuss five within this video. What won't be discussed is fluid volume overload and systemic infections. 
So we're going to start with phlebitis and phlebitis is the most common IV complication and it's just the inflammation of a vein guys. This inflammation can be due to mechanical inflammation which is by means of the IV cannula. It can be too big which will irritate the vein. Also chemical inflammation which is due to the medication or vesicant and a vesicant is a medication that causes a blistering effect okay. Lastly bacteria can also cause phlebitis and it is termed septic phlebitis when there is bacteria okay. So phlebitis is graded on a scale of 0 to 4 and the manifestations that will accompany it is pain, redness, and edema at the insertion site. Now the nursing intervention here, we're going to want to discontinue the infusion at the first sign of phlebitis, guys. That's at one plus on the infiltration scale. And we're going to want to apply warm or cold compress to the affected site. Also elevating the extremity is going to prevent venous return, which will help prevent further inflammation, okay? Next is infiltration and extravasation, guys. Now infiltration, the medication that was being given has leaked out of the vessel into the extravascular tissue due to the vein being punctured or if the medication leaks out of the insertion site in the vein, okay? This is what causes the manifestations such as edema and pain. We're going to want to discontinue the IV, elevate the extremity, and apply warm compress to the site. So if we look at the image to the left, we see that the IV catheter goes through the vein, but instead of staying in there, it actually punctures out on the other side as seen here, guys. The medication is being administered in the extravascular tissue. Now for extravasation, burning redness, blisters, and possible necrosis which is tissue death is going to be seen here we're going to want to discontinue the iv and apply cool compress guys moving on we get to ear embolism and this happens when ear gets into a vessel and occludes or blocks the vessel guys an example of how ear can get into a vessel is through iv therapy there can possibly be ear bubbles within the chamber of a syringe or the lumen of an iv catheter which will further bring it into the vessel so it's going to be important to get rid of as much air as possible before administering any iv meds manifestations seen are going to reflect where the ear embolism may be but for the most part palpitations dyspnea which is shortness of breath or labored breathing possible jugular vein distensions as well as a cough may be seen cyanosis also may be seen and this is a bluish appearance of the skin due to the inadequate blood flow or circulation to a specific area in this case air is what is blocking the area guys nursing interventions to correct this complication is going to start with clamping the cannula which will prevent any further fluid or air from entering the vessel we don't want anything else affecting the site now the next intervention is trendelenburg which refers to a position we see in the image to the left and this position will also help prevent the air from traveling within the system and causing further complications such as a heart attack guys lastly we're going to want to administer that oxygen and it's going to be important as well to monitor the vital signs and doing assessments as needed our last complication to discuss is that of a hematoma which is a localized mass of blood that has leaked outside of a vessel. This usually occurs due to either the technique used by the person using the syringe or the needle size guys the size can be too big might puncture the vessel and cause that leaked out blood so nursing management is going to start with the removal of the catheter and direct application of a sterile two by two gauze pad to the site also elevating the extremity will promote that venous return that we do need guys and that is it for iv complications guys thank you for tuning in hope you enjoyed it hit that like button subscribe comment and if you haven't already seen my fluid volume presentation you can follow this video up with that because they correlate in that of fluid with volume. Other than that, I'll catch you guys next time.